War Pugs, we're here to watch The Fat Electrician. And I got a feeling you noticed something. Check this out. Special thanks to The Fat Electrician for this. Also, guys, if you were wondering what some of the other stuff from Fat Electrician looks like, Check this out. So I got on the Quack Bang shirt, the Quack Bang Grenade Duck. Yes, I love it. Check this out. Oh my god, I can't do basic things. Now this is my personal favorite slogan so far. Unhealthcare, guys. What am I doing? Turn this off. Stop being a boomer. There we go. Boom. Unhealthcare. Guys, these shirts are nice. They feel good. They look good. They're guaranteed to make to increase your charisma stat by at least two. I'm just saying. And a slogan so near to my own, it's never a war crime the first time. And if you guys know anything about me, you know that good times rhymes with war crimes. So, with that being said, special thanks to Fat Electrician because now I got drip. Guys, if you want some drip of your own, check the description down below for Fat Electrician. Uh, dot com. That's where you'll find shirts like these, as well as some other stuff down there. Get yourself something nice for Christmas, you know? Christmas is right around the corner. Thanksgiving. Do it some. Just get something. In any case, guys, it's time to learn about the Royal Air Force's legless anti-hero, Sir Douglas Bader. And do I know anything about this guy? No. Am I, am I about to learn about him? Oh, yeah. So... Guys, over the next, like, I've been saying the whole layout of the backdrop is going to change. I've been saying that for about a couple of weeks now. I was hoping to do it all in one shot. I was hoping to do everything in a single shot. It's not going to happen. It's going to take me some time to do it. Sorry, sorry. It is the way, it is what it is. I, I'm never going to get ahead the way I want to get ahead. It is the nature of the beast. Um... I cry inside every time. But until I do get ahead the way I want to get ahead, well, we'll just have to keep on trucking, won't we? Guys, uh, I'm going to slowly start putting stuff up. You're going to notice the stuff is coming down. Patreons, by the way, the uh, Superman and the Doctor Doom posters are going to be coming down. Those are going to be up on Patreon uh, soon. And uh, those are going to be a part of a giveaway I'm going to do. Um, happen to determine what I'm going to do. Might just be a random draw. Might be something else. But if you're interested in those, um, that's where they're going to be. The Star Trek poster, if I give it up, my wife will murder me. Um, and, um, she's been watching a lot of ID Discovery and how I got away with it. So you know she'll be able to do it. It is what it is. Again, everybody, um, just a whole bunch of... There's a lot of fun stuff coming down the pipeline. But what's even more fun is about what we're about to find out from the fat electrician. Who is Sir Douglas Bader and what does what does he do? Okay, who is your daddy and what does he do? Let's get into it. Let's learn some stuff about history we didn't know before, guys. Let's go. You know somebody's an absolute gangster when they're not an American and I'm still going to make a video about them. Go for it. Today we're talking about Sir Douglas Bada, a World War II Bada. British RAF fighter pilot ace with at least 22 confirmed kills, and he managed to do all of that as a double amputee with no legs, which I think we can all agree is a pretty impressive feat. Yes. Bastard! Why? Why? Why would you go there? Ah! Or lack thereof. But first, I want to sponsor because this video is brought to you by Permasafe. All right, here's oh, the there Permasafe we go. is not the average set of rubber gloves that you've seen at the hospital before. These things are designed for people that work outside of a clinical setting with their hands. That still a large part of my large part of you know my group here with War Pugs, we are 40k nerds. If you guys paint miniatures, this would be something for you to take a look at don't want to touch something gross or something hazardous. Your paramedics, your law enforcement officers, construction workers, mechanics, farmers, anybody that's working a manual labor job where typical rubber gloves simply aren't going to hold up, you have Permasafe. These things have diamond texture on the palms so that even if your hands get greasy or wet, you still have traction and you're able to grab stuff. They're also twice as thick and four times more puncture and tear resistant. Okay, check. Then your paints, my guys this out okay look at this 
That's like half a gallon of water inside this rubber glove right now. That's quality jiggling right there, okay? <laughs> this is what the Hulk's jeans are made out of. Oh, no, now my hands are all wet from filling up that other glove with a bunch of water. Listen to all the traction and grip I still have with these goddamn gloves. And here's the best part about these. You don't have to go to a special website. You don't have to follow my link. You don't have to use my discount code. You can just go to Amazon. They are on Amazon Prime. You can order these and have them at your house tomorrow. And I nice. Know what you're thinking, but chubby electron guy, I don't need rubber gloves, okay? <laughs> Listen to me. Rubber gloves are like jumper cables and condoms. You never need them until you need them. Just trust me on this one. Go to Amazon. I have a set, uh, I have a, like, literal box of extra large nitrile gloves sitting in the back of my truck because you never really know when you're gonna need them. Like, you never really know when you're gonna need them. Buy yourself a box of PermaSafe gloves, keep them in your car, in your garage, and at some point in the future, you're gonna be holding something absolutely disgusting in your hands. You're gonna be like, wow. That electrician was right. This was definitely worth the money. So yeah, yep. get yourself some PermaSafe gloves because shit happens. It just doesn't have to happen on your hands. Back there you the go. Video. All right, Douglas Bader, born in London in 1910. World War One was going on when he was a child. His father and his older brother-in-law both fought in World War One. His father was an engineer and his brother-in-law was a fighter pilot. Because of that, mm -hmm. young Douglas knew that he wanted to be a fighter pilot too. So Ballin. fast forward, 1928, Bada's is 18 years old. He just graduated from high school. He immediately joins the RAF as a cadet pilot, as well as going to Cambridge for college. And while doing that, he would become a star athlete for both organizations. While nice. in Cambridge, he would play hockey, box, and and become a star rugby player. Apparently he was so good at rugby that it was believed that after college he would join the national team to represent his country. And then for the RAF he would end up playing on their official cricket team. Oh, by the way, I was gonna congratulate somebody the next time I got and thank you for reminding me on that. I just can't remember who. Uh, what happened here? What happened here? I know what happened at some point. Oh, well, I thought that something happened a little bit earlier, but as far as rugby went, I was going to congratulate somebody. Um, never mind. I'm an idiot. You guys know this. Just say boomer moment in the comments and let it be done. Team, I have no idea what cricket is, and I really don't care to learn. Nobody understands cricket. You gotta know what a crumpet is to understand cricket. I mean, yeah, I thought crumpet was the mountain that the Grinch lived on, so obviously yeah. I have no idea what's going on. Fast forward again, two years, 1930. He's still going to college at Cambridge, but he graduates from a cadet to a full-fledged commissioned pilot in the RAF. Sweet. At which point, he becomes known as an absolute daredevil while also being extremely talented. He can pull off every aerial maneuver known to man at this point, including some that are so dangerous dangerous that they're banned and not only does he do those maneuvers he does them below 2,000 feet which is also against the rules because it's extremely dangerous but Bader doesn't care about rules he doesn't care what you tell him that's just guidelines he's gonna do what he wants because of that he actually gets selected to represent his squadron at the Hendon Air Show in a flying competition which he wins so basically he is legitimately Rage Against the Machine personified in the early 30s sweet Ends. Then later that year in 1931, he is preparing to go defend his title at the Hendon Air Show in early 1932, at which point he tries a dangerous maneuver too close to the ground, and the wing of his Bristol Bulldog catches the ground, Ooh. crashes the entire plane, crushing his legs. Because of this, both of his legs would have to get amputated, one above the knee and one just below the knee. At this point, you have to remember it's the 1930s, he is told that he's never going to be able to walk again without crutches. And that's what they believe, because nobody had ever done it before. But you also have to remember, Bada doesn't care what people tell him. The same attitude that got him into this mess by not listening to the rules is the same attitude that's going to get him out of this mess by not listening to what the experts tell him he's going to be capable of doing. Over the... Rage Against the Machine personified in the form of an RAF pilot. I'm with it so far. Let's go. Of course of his rehabilitation, not only does he regain the ability to walk without crutches or a cane, something he was told was going to be impossible, he also regains the ability to drive his sports car, golf, and dance all on dual prosthetics. And he managed to do all of that in four months, essentially by what the because fuck? all the experts thought it was impossible. It wasn't like modern day where there's an expert that has a refined process on how to help somebody out in his situation. No, this man blazed the entire path on his own with no background in physical therapy. He just figured it out. So fast forward June, 1932, five months after losing both of his legs, he shows back up to the RAF like, hey guys, 
made a full recovery. Let's get me up in one of those planes so I can take it for a spin. Right. At which point they tell him, absolutely not. You don't have your legs. We're not going to let you fly. He then argues with the RAF, to which they agree that they're going to let him have a test flight with another pilot. And if he does good, everything should be fine. So that's exactly what they do. He takes a plane. It takes a lot of bitching to get somebody to listen to you when the military doesn't want to do something. Up, he does a bunch of maneuvers. He lands the plane, all with the use of his prosthetic legs. No problem whatsoever because he is a phenomenal pilot. He then gets cleared by a medical board saying that he is fit for active duty and he is reinstated as a pilot. Fast Baller. forward one year later, April 1933, the RAF, for seemingly no reason, decided that they were going to reverse that decision and ground him because there was nothing in the King's regulations in regards to a legless pilot. To which Bada's like, yeah, no shit, I'm the first guy that's ever done it ever. That's why you guys put me through all that testing and a med board to see if I could do it. And I've been doing it for the last year. Why would you ground me now? To which the RAF was like, don't really care. That's what we decided. Fuck you. Get out of the plane. Bada is then informed that he has to pick a new job where he stays on the ground. And Bada, being a man of his stature, isn't going to stand for that shit. So he retires early. From there, he spends the next couple of years collecting his military pension, working a desk job, golfing 36 holes a day. He also meets his wife and starts to settle down. Okay. Then, of course, in 1937, 1938, Douglas would write the air ministry multiple times saying, hey, if the next world war is going to kick off, let me know. I'm happy to come back and fly a plane for you. Then fast forward, sure enough, September 1st, 1939, Germany invades Poland. World War II kicks off and the RAF finally decides to call back Douglas Bob. <laughs> so Douglas shows back up in an RAF base and he is pumped because last time he was flying planes was eight years ago and they were like old biplanes like his Bristol Bulldog. Nice. Now, they got spitfires, they got hurricanes. Planes have come a long ways in eight years and he is absolutely thrilled to be able to get up and fly one. And oh. at this point, RAF leadership yet again informs Douglas, oh, we're not actually gonna let you fly a plane. You don't have any legs, that would be preposterous. We thought you wanted to join the war effort and do a ground job just to help out. At which point, Douglas is furious. I am a peacock, you gotta let me fly! Luckily, however, some people <laughs> that Douglas had served with prior eight years ago were now higher ranking officers in nice. the poll, and they convinced the higher leadership to give this guy a shot because he's an incredible pilot. So the higher ups finally agree to give Douglas a shot, but that shot entails him going back through flight school all over again, which he does, and after his first 11 hours of flying with an instructor, he is finally allowed to take up a plane on his own, and the first thing he does is invert it and fly it upside down at <laughs> a low altitude right past all the instructors. <laughs> <laughs> the middle finger. He then peels off and goes and does a bunch of other maneuvers. And you have to realize this is the first time he's been inside of the cockpit of a plane by himself in like a decade. Right. The last time he was flying a plane solo, it was his Bristol Bulldog, which is a biplane. And now he's flying a Spitfire. This is a huge upgrade. And he is blown away at how incredible this plane handles. He's able to take turns and pull off maneuvers way tighter and way faster than he ever would have dreamed of being able to do inside of a biplane. Uh. And at least he gives all the credit to the new airplane and how advanced aircrafts have become but then the spitfire the spitfire was a gargantuan gargantuan improvement on any other plane of the of his type at the time you had to go all the way around the world to find another plane that was as comparable as it was now people talk about the bf-109 BF-109 uh, variants, all this other kind of stuff. They talk about all that kind of stuff. They talk about the Russian Yak. They talk about a couple Hungarian planes. The Spitfire won the Battle of Britain. Hands down, there is no real, there is no real anything about it. it the, the, the development of the Spitfire was a completely different kind of scenario. Um, there's a lot of, there was a lot of back and forth about that. But to find another plane that had as much of an impact on a war theater, you would have to look to the um, you'd have to look to the Japanese Zero or the P fifty one Mustang in terms of impact on a war theater that that plane had. It was legitimately the fight. It was the plane that won the Battle of Britain for the most part. 
And over the course of a little bit more training, he starts to realize not all the other pilots can pull off these turns and maneuvers as tight and as fast as he can inside of the Spitfire. They have the same plane. Is right. he just that much better than these guys, or what is going on? Hmm. And then it dawns on him. Well, you ain't got no legs, Lieutenant Dane. <laughs> Yes, I know that. He realizes that it's all because of G-Force, because when a pilot takes a turn or does a maneuver, oh. they're exposed to G-Force. Mm. And if they do it too fast or too tight, they're exposed to too much G-Force. All the blood in their body rushes down to their legs, and they lose consciousness. Okay, you see where this is going? Doug doesn't yep. have any legs for the blood to rush to. G-Force is just Viagra to this guy at this point. <laughs> he is literally the real-life version of Star Fox. Yeah, remember the Nintendo video game? You ever notice how Star Fox and everybody in his crew all have metal legs? According to the internet lore, it's because they all had their legs amputated to resist G-Force more. In a weird twist of fate, his disability has turned into... I didn't know that. I wondered why he called him uh, the star, like real life Star Fox in the thumbnail. I was wondering why that was the case. I now know that was a that's dark for a kid's game. Like I was very young when I played that game. There's some lore for you into a physical advantage inside the cockpit of a fighter plane. He quite literally has a leg up on the competition. Dude! And because of this, a lot of other fighter pilots and high-ranking officers in the RAF start to not like Bada because they claim that he's arrogant and difficult to work with because here he is getting told he's never going to walk again. Not only does he walk again, he learns how to golf, he learns how to drive a car, and now here he is out-piloting most of them. What an arrogant prick. Luckily, Doug doesn't really give a shit. He's not here to make friends. He's here to win a war, and that's exactly what he sets about doing. His first combat mission is over the skies of Dunkirk, during Operation Dynamo. If oh. you don't know, this is the operation where they had to evacuate the entire British military from Dunkirk. Oh. Yes, this is what the movie Dunkirk is about. If you don't know... If you have not watched Dunkirk, you need to go watch Dunkirk. Because, holy shit, Dunkirk is probably one of the best movies I've seen in the last decade. It's exceptionally well done. I liked... Yes. The whole... If you... He's about to explain Dunkirk. Dunkirk was such a desperate situation in the Second World War because the Nazis stood such a huge percentage of simply wiping out the entire British army. The entire British army came within a few miles of being just completely wiped out with no chance of saving. Um... The story of Dunkirk is one of the most, um, like, they should have turned the, that day into a, I don't know if they did, but if they didn't, they really should have turned it into a national damned holiday, because the country saved its army, the army didn't save its country that day, and what technically was... In any other, in any other way, any other way that you could see this, if it had been a few, purely military operation, this would have been a crushing and humiliating defeat. But this turn from that and this, because of what happened with Dunkirk, the whole story turned into this massive thing about. Um, it it turned into a whole different scenario because. The civilians that own boats on the English countryside actually rolled out in droves and saved the army and turned what should, what it had every fucking right to be one of the worst disasters in military history into one of the best war, like one of the best stories of, you know, human perseverance and the, the like, essentially the human spirit. It was, I, I, if I ever had a chance to meet one of those one of those people who was involved with evacuating the British Army out of Dunkirk, I'd fucking shake their hand and want to get their goddamn autograph because they were baller as shit. I'm just saying. Continuing on. Basically, when Germany took over France using their new Blitzkrieg tactic, they took over France so fast that the British Army couldn't even get a foothold inside of France to start fighting back. Right. The entire military was caught and surrounded in the city of Dunkirk, and they had to evacuate their entire army 
barely making it out with their lives. And Douglas Botta was in the skies over Dunkirk in a Spitfire, running defense for these guys while they got evacuated. Holy During shit. During this time, Botta claimed to have shot down five German Messerschmitt BF 109s, but he is only officially credited with shooting down one and potentially damaging several others. Because every time Botta says that he shot down an enemy plane, it is extremely scrutinized because, again, a lot of the other fighter pilots and leadership don't like him because they think he's an arrogant prick. So, literally, every <laughs> <laughs> that Bada is officially credited with shooting down has been spotted by him, his wingmen, and an independent third party on the ground to verify that he shot that plane down before they would give him credit for it. But that's besides the point. Whether he shot down one enemy or five ultimately doesn't really matter because Douglas Bada and the rest of the RAF were able to hold off the German Air Force from bombing the men on the ground long enough for the entire British military to get evacuated so that they could live to fight another day. And because of this... And this was all like... Some of this was military ships, you guys, but a lot of it was done by civilians in pleasure craft. Like, sailing boats, tugboats, fishing boats. Watch Dunkirk. Research Dunkirk. This Douglas was promoted to squadron leader and given command of squadron 242, or at least what was left of it. You see, squadron 2... I, I gotta go back to this picture. I gotta go back to this picture. Look at how arrogant... Like... I can see why they thought that he was an arrogant prick in this. Okay, I'm I'm doing the I'm doing the back. There we go. Look at his face. Look at his face right here. He's like, yeah, I fucking did it. And who's to blame him? I'd be saying that the rest of my damned life. Yeah, I fucking did it. You see, Squadron 242 was a bunch of Canadian hurricane pilots that had been stationed in France and had been fighting the Luftwaffe for a while, and they had sustained heavy losses, and their morale was cripplingly low. Bada comes Dude, to the Dude, come on! Turns the entire squadron around, takes a squadron in shambles, and turns them into an effective fighting force. Nice. Team, cutting through red tape and bureaucratic bullshit to get his men what they needed to be successful. And because of this, even more of his peers and the chain of command starts to like him less because he is sticking up for his subordinates. Nice. And to me, this is the most important part of the entire story because as this story continues to go on, you're going to notice that the more successful this man becomes, the more and more some people tend to not like him and try to trash his reputation. I have People are always... I'll tell you this, guys. People are always going to try to kick you, kick you down. People are always going to try to give you shit. People are always going to try... Doing all this other kind of crap. This guy lost both of his fucking legs, and at every single turn, every single turn of the page, people shat on him. Okay? Fucking Lieutenant Dan is flying a Spitfire. Fuck your couch. Okay? If people are shitting on you right now, fuck them. Fuck them. Do your thing. Watched countless interviews of other people talking about their relationship with Douglas Botta when he was alive, and all of their opinions can be summed up into one of two. Opinion number one, he is a literal superhero. Opinion number two, he was an arrogant prick, but even I can't deny he was a good <laughs> fighter pilot. And oddly enough, all of the people that thought he was an arrogant prick were fighter pilots that were in an adjacent unit, mm -hmm. or leaders that were in an adjacent unit, not his unit, because his chain of command absolutely loved him, and all of the men that served underneath him also absolutely loved him. To give you an idea of how highly his men thought of him, one of the pilots that served underneath him, Sir Alan Smith, later in life said in an interview about the time that Douglas Botta made him second in command for a mission, it felt like God had told me to come up and keep an eye on heaven for him. Which to me says everything, because I think how you're perceived by your subordinates is a yes. far better metric of your character than how you are seen by the people competing against you for a promotion. Or uh, I'm pretty sure you're wrong because I read on the internet one time that somebody's grandpa met him once during World War II, and that guy's <laughs> grandpa told him that Douglas Botta wasn't very polite. Fuck. Jesus Christ. Okay, first of all, word of mouth four degrees removed is not a reputable source, so I don't really care. Second of all, even if that was true, let's put it into perspective. Do Your it. Grandpa met the guy while he was in World War II. Okay, so at this point in time, Douglas Botta is literally a legless man in the biggest ass kicking contest the world has ever seen, and he's winning. Okay, the guy's probably got a lot on his plate. It wouldn't surprise me if he was a little stressed out and maybe angry sometimes. Okay, shit happens. Get over it. 
You know what? I'm sorry. I'm getting sidetracked. It just really, really annoys me when people that have never met somebody go out of their way to shit on their legacy for doing something incredible because it makes them feel better about themselves. Right. Anyways, moving on. All right, fast forward July 1940. Douglas and Squadron 242 are going to partake in... Like, you weren't with... You weren't there. You weren't dealing with the shit that they were dealing with. Who the fuck are you? In the defense of Great Britain during the Battle of Britain, which if you don't know, is a period in time between July and October of 1940, where the Germans essentially tried to bomb Great Britain every single day. During this time, Squadron yep. 242 is credited with shooting down 62 enemies and only having four of their own shot down. Of those 62 enemies that were shot down, four of them were shot down by Douglas Bada. This would bring his career total to five, officially making him an ace fighter pilot. Because of this, news outlets pick up the story and they begin to portray Douglas as the hero of the Battle of Great Britain, essentially using him for pure propaganda. Like, hey, check this out. Now remember, now remember, he had to get it verified by a wingman and an independent source on the ground in order, to in order for it to be qualified as a kill. Great Britain has a legless fighter ace, and he is helping to win the war against the Nazis. We literally have a legless man beating you guys in an ass-kicking contest. What's up? So now Douglas is getting all this attention. He's being used for effective propaganda, mm -hmm. which is great, but it also serves to drive the divide even further between him and the other fighter pilots that already didn't like him, because now they're jealous that he's getting a bunch of attention for doing just as well as a lot of them did. And if that wasn't bad enough, he's now also on the shit list of the really high ranking officers in the RAF because he had the audacity to back up his boss and friend, Lee Mallory. Basically the standard operating procedure for the RAF during the defense of Britain was kind of like aerial guerrilla tactics. Okay. As soon as they identified an incoming bombing run, they would scramble a small group of RAF fighters that would go up and utilize hit and run tactics to shoot down the bombers. Lee Mallory, on the other hand, thought that they should respond with overwhelming force in a strategy that he referred to as the Big Wing. And this was essentially taking somewhere between three and five squadrons in one giant formation, like 50 to 70 fighter planes all at once and running right towards the bombing runs. And yeah. Douglas agreed that this was a good strategy and he was a huge proponent of it. Ultimately, throughout the Battle of Britain, the Big Wing was only used five times. Of the five times that it was used, the men that flew in the formation said that it was incredibly effective and they shot down a bunch of enemies. The men that did not fly in the formation said that it wasn't as effective as they're claiming it was and that they're lying. So that aspect is kind of an unknown, but we do know for certain that planes flying in the big wing formation were safer because their safety in numbers right. that makes sense. They were less likely to get shot down. The downside of the big wing was that it took a lot of time to get that many planes up in the air and in formation. So response time was lower. So as far as which plane was better aerial guerrilla warfare or the big wing i'm not really sure but one thing is for certain using both of them multiple times had a beneficial effect because the first time the big wing was used all the german pilots were being told that great britain only had 10 15 20 aircrafts left and they go out on this bombing run and here comes 70 spitfires and, <laughs> and just fucks up their whole day it had a devastating effect on enemy morale and on top yeah. of that now they don't know what the british tactics are they have to both anticipate being attacked with overwhelming numbers and being attacked with a small fast responsive hit and run force which mm -hmm. made it very difficult for the germans to plan their attacks because now they had to plan for both overwhelming numbers and a fast responsive force so yeah in addition to his newfound fame people are also upset that he had the audacity to have an opinion of how to conduct aerial warfare even though he's an ace fighter pilot and presumably an expert in aerial warfare but Whatever. Regardless, yeah. Douglas ends up getting a promotion to wing commander, and he is now in charge of three squadrons instead of one. So nice. From late 1940 to August of 1941, Douglas and his men take the fight to the Germans, flying hundreds of missions, shooting down a ton of Germans. Douglas himself shoots down an additional 17, bringing his career total to 22, six probables, and a bunch more shared. But on August 9th, 1941, Douglas Botta would fly his last mission ever when he would collide in midair with a German Messerschmitt BF-109. Somehow, Douglas survives the initial impact, but his plane is absolutely going down, so he quickly opens the canopy and goes to climb out of the plane, but the impact has crushed one of his prosthetic legs inside the cockpit, and he can't get out. So he's pulling on it, he's pulling on it, he's desperately trying to get out of this plane and time is running out he only has a few seconds left and he says fuck it it's worth a shot and he opens his parachute while still inside the plane 
Oh. His parachute catches wind and rips him out of his prosthetic and out of the cockpit. He then attempts to evade German capture, hopping around on a single prosthetic leg. God! He captured and becomes a prisoner of war. Okay, now to be fair, technically we don't know for sure that it was a mid-air collision that he was involved in because his plane was never recovered. And like I said, everything Douglas reports back is extremely scrutinized because leadership doesn't like him. And right. came to the conclusion that Douglas made up the mid-air collision story because he didn't want to have to admit that he was shot down and bested by a German pilot. And the reasoning for that is that the German documentation captured after the war didn't show that there was any mid-air collision around this time period. Oh, come a on. To that, the documentation also didn't show that they shot down Douglas either. So right. now the leading theory is that he was actually a victim of friendly fire somehow. Which, you know what, to be fair, as much as I want to have Bada's back on this one, if you take a step back and really look at it, it does make perfect sense because what person in their right mind would take the word of their own guy who was fucking there and lived through it over the word of the German military in the 1940s. I mean, the Germans back then were just batting a hundred. They never fucking lied about I anything know. ever. No. They definitely didn't build an entire military in secrecy, violating the Treaty of Versailles so they could try to take over the fucking planet. I, yeah, I don't know why they would bother questioning that, you know, at, at all. I mean, um, and they definitely didn't have a crazy military dictator dosed up on amphetamines and testosterone who people were literally scared to give him bad news. There's no way that they would lie on this documentation. No way. Right, so back to Douglas. He's hanging out at this POW camp with one prosthetic leg. Word finally gets spread around throughout Britain and throughout the German ranks that they finally caught the famous legless fighter ace that the British had. And upon hearing that, one of Germany's most famous fighter pilot aces, Adolf Galland, who had apparently been running missions against Bada for a while now, wanted to go meet him in person. And for whatever reason, he's actually nice to Bada. So nice that he actually writes the British government and is like, not all okay so one thing one thing to note not all people in the wire mark were assholes not all people in the luftwaffe were assholes um i think at some point um i I'd, I'd lo either i'd love to hear see something from you guys about the you know, I, in fact, as a matter of fact, I was going to talk about uh, what happened in Nanking and the literal, the literal car-carrying Nazi that is immortalized as a statue there, as a statue in that city in China. But um, yeah, I really don't want to talk about what happened in Nanking at all, ever, under any circumstance. But moving on. Like, hey, we got your guy. He's missing one of his legs. Would you guys mind airdropping another prosthetic for him so he could walk around? To which Britain is like, absolutely, sure, why not? Great Britain launches Operation Leg, where they are given really? a message through German airspace to airdrop an extra prosthetic leg for Bada. And then after dropping the leg, they kept going and bombed the local power plant. Okay, look. <laughs> both his legs he decides that <laughs> that's fucked up but i don't care this is going to be his personal mission to be the biggest pain in the ass humanly possible he's nice. going to constantly try to escape the pow camp and he is going to fuck with the guards every chance he gets or as he calls it goon baiting nice his first attempts at escape he's on like the third story of a hospital so he takes all the bed sheets he can find ties them together in a rope just like you see in the movies ties it to the radiator in the room throws the rope out the window but the rope isn't long enough and he's looking around he's like shit what else can i use there's a guy in a coma that he's sharing the room with so he ties the rope to that guy's bed frame and pushes the guy in the coma bed over to the window to get it close enough to the ground he repels down to the ground and runs off but the germans catch him again then after he gets out of the hospital he goes to a normal pow camp where he tries to andy dufresne his way out he tries to no. dig a tunnel out of the pow camp using his prosthetic leg as a shovel and taking all the excess dirt that he has putting it inside of his prosthetic leg and walking a ways with it before falling down to dump out all the excess dirt so they never see any big dirt piles. But eventually that plane oh gets my busted God. too. And then in August of 1942, after a year in captivity, he finally makes it out of the POW camp. He escapes and he's gone for like 36 hours. They put out a nationwide manhunt. They're getting posters ready. They are absolutely going to find this guy. They were getting their ass kicked by him in aerial combat. Yes. There's no way that these guys are going to admit 
that a man with no legs was able to escape their POW camp. Eventually, they do end up tracking him down, take him back into custody, at which point they decide they're going to send him to Colditz Castle, which is believed to be an inescapable prison, which is apparently where he has to go because they are absolutely not going to let the guy with no legs get away. And that is where he would remain until 1945 when the U.S. Army liberated him nice. and returned him home. From there, he would receive a hero's welcome, retire from the RAF, and then a movie would be made about his life called Reach for the Sky. It is considered to be a classic piece of British film. Nice. And it made him one of the most famous men on the planet at this point in time. He then decided that he was going to use all of his newfound fame to put out the message that it was still possible to accomplish things after a horrific injury and becoming disabled. And he became one of, if not the biggest advocate for disabled people on the planet. For this service to the world, he would end up getting knighted by the queen and officially become mm -hmm. Sir Douglas Botta. He would then continue to travel and give talks and advocate for the rest of his life until passing away at the age of 72 on you absolute baller september 5th 1982 but one of those talks that he gave is actually my favorite part of this entire story because it really captures how much of an anti-hero douglas botta really was he was giving a speech at an all-girls school telling his incredible story about being a pilot during world war ii uh -huh. and at some point during that story he says and i quote so there were two of the fuckers behind me three of the fuckers to my right and another fucker on the left at this point the audience is like <laughs> And the headmistress of the school has all the color drained from her face and she goes ghost white and she's like, ladies, ladies, a fucking is a German aircraft. At which point, Sir Douglas Bader replies, and I quote, that may be, madame, but these fuckers are not <laughs> electrician.com get some merch, subscribe to Patreon. Thanks for watching. Quack bag <laughs> out. <laughs> The lengths haters will go to just to hate will never, ever cease to amaze me. Right. Okay. So, real quick. Okay. Lieutenant Dan didn't have any fucking legs, okay? <laughs> he just didn't have any fucking legs. So let's recap this guy's military career after he loses his damned legs. He gets back in a pilot he gets back in the pilot seat. He takes he takes on command of a squad. Then he takes on the command of a wing. He gets downed in Germany. Somehow, some way, some way, some shape, some form, fights the Battle of Britain, gets down in Germany, escapes from mili escapes from a POW camp twice. What are you gonna say to this guy? You ain't gonna say shit. You ain't saying nothing. Okay, look. I love stories like this. It's also a prime example. It doesn't matter what you've gone through. Like, just realize, people, people are going to sit there and take shots at you. People are going to take shots at you for, for out, out of any number of reasons, either real or imagined. People are going to take shots at you, okay? You do you, okay? You do you. You be you, okay? That's what I say. Okay, you be you. If you're not hurting anybody by being yourself, then be your fucking self, okay, War Pugs? That is the number one thing about this. Everybody told this guy to sit down. Well, not really sit down, you know. Everybody told him, you don't have any legs. Just stay in a chair and don't do any fucking thing. He said, fuck you. I'm going to go shoot down some Germans. That's exactly what he did. <sighs> And people, and people still found it in their cold, dead hearts to be a hater on him anyway. I'm sorry, at some point, you just need to learn how to take a tall, warm glass and shut the fuck up and deal with your little insecurities about whatever's going on. Because there's no reason to hate on this dude right now. There's no reason to hate on this dude. He's out there doing what he loves. Sucks to be you, he's doing it better than you. Guy is a baller. Sir Douglas Botter, you are a baller, good sir. Um, guys, I'm wrapping this up. 
All of the Final Night Treasures links are going to be in the description down below, including links to get yourself some stuff like this. That's FinalNightTrition.com. Check out my links in the description down below. Um, we're going to have a new merch set up soon. And pretty soon, I will have... So this is... This is my personal favorite because the slogan so closely matches my own. It's never a war crime the first time, guys, but good times rhymes with war crimes. Eventually, there's going to be a shirt for this. I'm going to I'm gonna do, he sent me one of his, I'm going to, he sent me some of his, I'm going to send him one of mine. I'm going to send the fat electrician a good times rhymes with war crimes shirt. I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. Yes. War pugs. I will catch you guys next time. If you take anything from this video, if you take anything from my rantings and ravings over the amount of time that I've been on YouTube, if you take anything, just know that for me, you guys are important just the way you fucking are. Okay? Just the way you fucking are. Flat out. I'll, I'll catch you guys next time. I'm done.